Thanks, Myung. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back with you today. I thought that uh, now that I was closer to the front of the schedule that I would have all fresh slides, but uh, that didn't even work. Uh, you'll see some of the same slides from the previous presentation. So I guess the first disclosure I'd like to make is that, uh, that I am not an expert at this operation. I, I'm more of a student of this operation. And, and uh, one thing that I've learned so far is there is a lot to learn about doing this operation, and certainly a lot to learn about doing this operation well. Uh, as was already touched on, uh, this problem is a much more prevalent problem than we once thought. And uh, if you do the math, uh, the number of, we thought that about one to 5% of patients who have pulmonary emboli, acute PEs, go on to develop this disease. So if you figure about 3,000 to 15,000 cases annually, and if you look at the definitive treatment, as we'll learn, which is surgery, in the United States, there are only about up to maybe 300 or maybe a little more than that done per year. So there is a big gap in where these patients are and certainly where these patients, uh, why these patients aren't being treated. So this is the, uh, the algorithm of evaluation uh, that we saw earlier. And important parts of that, as we learned uh, early this morning, are the, the VQ scan. Uh, in somebody with pulmonary hypertension, uh, very early on in that algorithm, uh, a VQ scan can tell you uh, pretty definitively, yes or no, whether uh, CTAP is the, is the problem. Uh, pulmonary uh, arteriogram, certainly from a surgical point of view, very helpful in uh, not only making the diagnosis, but helping you with a map of how you're going to plan and execute your surgical operation. Uh, again, whether or not somebody is uh, an operative candidate is, as mentioned earlier, a very complicated question. It has to do with not only the presence of the disease, but the extent of the disease. And given the extent of the disease, the experience of the surgeon and the experience of the center. It's a very, this is an operation that is very nuanced uh, uh, and one that in order to be done correctly, correctly and effectively, the surgeon has to have uh, experience with those nuances. And it is an operation that comes with it uh, uh, significant, sometimes significant complications that need to be managed with uh, an expert ICU team, with an expert team of nurses, uh, intensivists, therapists to, to get these patients through it. Um, the, there is a classification system, again, that came from U, U, UCSD, the, uh, the mothership, if you will of the management of this disease. Uh, type one, two, three, and four. Type one are those with fresh clots that uh, extend down into the, uh, uh, the main and low bar uh, and segmental arteries. Type two, uh, they, uh, the plane starts uh, in, the, uh, in the low bar and into the segmental arteries. Type three disease starts at the level of the segmental arteries and type four disease uh, into, the, uh, uh, into the periphery. Uh, and uh, by conventional wisdom, type 4 disease is usually not one that's considered to be approachable surgically, although some of the expert centers are tackling those patients. Um, uh, again, it's important to reiterate that at centers that are evaluating these patients, if thought not to be operative candidates, it's important to make sure that they're really not operative candidates. They may not be operative candidates at your center, uh, but they may be operative candidates at centers that have more experience. I guess that gets into the circular argument, then why not send all of these patients to the most experienced centers? And this certainly is a disease that as we learn more about it, we learn that there are more patients with it. And it would be impossible for the most experienced centers to be able to keep up with it. So I think it is, uh, the onus is upon centers of excellence to develop these programs and be able to manage and care for these patients uh, and add to the group of uh, expert centers. So the surgical principles, 
as I used to teach my residents, when you're doing an operation, you have to have a plan. Um, and so the, the plan of this operation is very different from doing a uh, pulmonary uh, embolectomy for acute PE. Uh, acute PE, you go on bypass, you keep the heart beating, uh, you open up the pulmonary artery, you put in a force up, uh, and you pull out a organized clot, sew up the artery, and you're done. Uh, it's, uh, it's from a technical point of view, as I mentioned yesterday, a pretty easy operation. That is not this operation. It's a, it's a, it's a much different operation. So there, uh, uh, at least uh, to my knowledge, nobody's doing these through minimal access surgery. It's done not only on cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, but uh, the, uh, uh, most of the time, and probably recommended, that they be done under circulatory arrest. It's kind of paradoxical that a disease that is causing a problem for decreased blood supply to the lungs, uh, the problem with doing these just on beating uh, on, on bypass is there's so much collateral blood flow that gets to the lungs to the bronchial arteries, you can't see in there unless you do circulatory arrest. Circulatory arrest is you uh, cool the patient's temperature down and you turn off the pump for uh, periods of time so there's really no blood flow, not only going to the lungs, but going to the rest of the body, including the brain. So you have to be uh, quite expeditious as well as effective in doing the, uh, doing, the op uh, doing the operation. As I mentioned, the operation is not an embolectomy, it's an endarterectomy. And the magic of the method is getting into the right plane uh, in that artery and then developing that plane, and by, uh, by doing an, an eversion technique, uh, pulling out, the, uh, pulling out the, the cast. So this is a specimen where you can see the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, organized uh, thrombus and the, the uh, intima of the artery extending up into the lobes and the segments and into the subsegmental level. And when you are done, you feather out into that periphery and it comes out uh, as one specimen. So again, these are done through a sternotomy. Uh, when you uh, cannulate the patient for bypass, just to orient you, the head is up here, feet down here. This is the patient's right, patient's left. Uh, usually cannulate uh, the uh, distal ascending aorta. Put uh, two cannulas, one into the superior vena cava, one into the inferior vena cava. Go on bypass, and then the heart shrinks up because you take all the blood away and uh, you uh, cool down uh, to usually about 20 or, or 18 degrees. Uh, once you get to that level, uh, you can put a retractor in to get into the right pulmonary artery uh, and make an incision into the right pulmonary artery. Uh, uh, and then, uh, as I said, the, the magic of the method is getting into the right plane. It's making an incision uh, into the uh, laminated uh, intima and organized clot and scar and webs, getting into uh, that uh, media, uh, not getting through uh, full thickness. Because if you get out into that artery, if you get, uh, if you perforate that artery, you may not be aware of it until after you come off pump, and the bleeding can be very difficult, if not impossible, to manage. Uh, there have been uh, surgical specialized instruments that have been developed to make this operation easier. Double action forceps that allow you to uh, hold the specimen while you're using a, uh, uh, an endarterectomy spatula that is different from what we usually use to do carotid endarterectomies or other endarterectomies of, uh, of, uh, of the peripheral arteries. Uh, once you're done with the right, you can go into the left, and, and again, this is all done under direct vision, where you can look down in through the incision in the artery uh, and, and watch under direct vision as you do the eversion uh, endarterectomy. And when you're done, uh, these are what the specimens should look like from level one, level two. So level one in the sort of the main pulmonary arteries extending down into the lobar and segmental arteries, uh, level two starting in the uh, low bar and going into the segmental arteries. Level three, just the segmental 
uh, arteries and level four into the sub-segmental components of the pulmonary artery. As I mentioned, uh, UCSD, uh, they have the most experience in the world, and they have uh, published uh, extensively uh, and taught uh, others uh, on, their, uh, uh, on their experience. Uh, and they're up to over uh, 3,500 cases over the last uh, 30 years or so. Uh, and uh, the mean age of their patients has been uh, about 53, with a slight uh, predominance for women. Uh, at least a third of the patients had uh, concomitant operations done, whether it's closing atrial septal defects or performing uh, valve or uh, coronary vascularization. It's a big operation in terms of time. Uh, when you're doing circuitry rest, it takes a time to cool the patient down, and it takes time to warm the patient up. So uh, their average operative time, and again, this is at a very experienced center, is seven hours. Uh, and the bypass times and the cross clamp times uh, 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 are by conventional heart surgery times uh, uh, robust. And the circuitry rest time of 42 minutes. So that's the amount of time that the patient's not getting any blood supply anywhere. Uh, and usually what is done is that time is broken down into two, two components. You, you don't want to have more than 20 minutes of circuitry rest time for this operation uh, in an extended time. So once you get to about 20 minutes, you turn the pump back on, you reperfuse the patient, and then after about 10 minutes or so, you can perform another period of circuitry rest uh, and uh, proceed. And we'll talk more about the impact of that uh, a little bit later. Uh, this is a bar graph of the experience at UCSD uh, since uh, 2000. And uh, they have, since 2000, been performing over 100 and uh, uh, approaching 200 of these operations a year. Um, as uh, you would expect with increasing experience, the mortality rate has uh, lessened over time. And I think that is a due to a combination of getting better at the nuances of the operation and perhaps, more importantly, getting better at selecting the patients uh, for, uh, for the operation. Uh, and so in addition to uh, better survival, if you look at uh, the outcomes, uh, looking at the hemodynamics, the, uh, there is significant improvement uh, in the pulmonary vascular resistance, in the pulmonary uh, artery pressure, the systolic uh, pulmonary pressure, and the cardiac output. Uh, all of these uh, are not only uh, statistically but clinically significantly improved. Uh, in terms of long-term survival, um, it is excellent, certainly compared to the natural history of this disease. Over a period of years, the, uh, the long-term survival is excellent. If you compare that to the survival of patients who receive lung transplants for pulmonary hypertension, uh, the one and uh, five-year uh, survival for lung transplant, uh, it certainly appears that this operation, a thromboendarterectomy, is a superior treatment uh, for uh, pulmonary hypertension in these patients. Um, there, is, uh, there have been reports from uh, the, an international CTEP registry, uh, which involves uh, uh, close to well, 679 patients in one Canadian and 26 uh, European centers. And they've reported on their experience. Uh, and uh, they have their analysis broken down into the experience of the center. So those centers who have done between 1 to 10, 11 to 50, and greater than 50 uh, operations. Uh, and as we learned, uh, that uh, in order to be considered an expert uh, center, um, the, that the, your experience matters. And uh, as expected, uh, looking at the mortality, as the experience of the center increased, the mortality rate uh, for those patients went down. Uh, uh, and interestingly, if you looked at the change in the pulmonary vascular resistance, uh, as the experience of the center went up, the change in the pulmonary vascular resistance went down, suggesting that maybe as a center got better, 
they were a little more um, uh, inclusive in taking on higher risk patients. Not only do these patients uh, live longer and are their hemodynamically, are their hemodynamics improved, but if you look at the New York Heart Association class, they're functionally much better. So preoperatively, the majority of these patients are uh, New York Heart Association class two and three, and some are four. Uh, after the operation, uh, the majority of them are New York Heart Association class one or two, uh, and that uh, those uh, functional improvements uh, both on the UCSD experience and in the international registry experience are sustained. Uh, if you look at the long-term outcomes of these patients, uh, looking at the uh, uh, CTEP registry uh, and some of the ways that they're managed, uh, uh, some of the patients, these are the, the same 679 patients looked at a little bit later on uh, with some additional surgeries performed on these patients. Uh, and I have to pay attention because in their graphs, they keep changing the colors in this graph. So this is uh, very uh, keen to sort of lean forward and look. So this is a, a graph uh, in the red, patients who received surgery compared to those patients who were treated uh, medically. And uh, not only uh, is the survival graph better for those patients who had surgery, that over time, uh, that graph uh, of survival uh, continues to widen. If you look at patients who, uh, uh, two groups of patients, both who have undergone surgery, but one segment of patients who received medical therapy in order to buff them up, uh, that didn't seem to make any difference uh, at all. In fact, it, now they've changed the color. So the patients who just went right to surgery are in blue and those who received uh, medical management in order to prepare them for surgery, it didn't make any, any difference in terms of their, uh, their survival at surgery or the survival uh, after surgery. If you look at those patients who were treated medically for pulmonary hypertension and didn't receive surgery with those who didn't get medical therapy, there wasn't that much of a difference uh, in terms of long-term survival. Uh, and certainly compared to surgery, uh, the surgical subset did, uh, did much better. How about complications? I said this was a big operation. As I was taught as a resident, if you do big operations, expect big complications. And there can be uh, big complications from this operation. And in the international experience, they had about a 10% incidence of pulmonary reperfusion edema. There were neuro uh, some neurologic outcomes uh, that were uh, about 10% and persistent pulmonary hypertension uh, in uh, about 17% uh, of the patients. So uh, the, the, the big issues that uh, uh, need to be uh, mentioned and managed are uh, lung reperfusion injury, pulmonary hypertension, excuse me, pulmonary hemorrhage, persistent pulmonary hypertension, and uh, neurologic and neurocognitive injury. So this is a, uh, uh, a chest X-ray of a patient who developed uh, reperfusion uh, pulmonary edema, and it can occur uh, usually in the first few days after the operation. Uh, and uh, many of those patients can be managed uh, with uh, a conventional therapy, uh, at times including going back on the, uh, on the ventilator and using uh, the, uh, the conventional ventilator technique. Some of these patients would benefit from going on uh, VV ECMO to be supported, and usually it will uh, resolve uh, on its own. As I mentioned, as you're doing this operation, uh, if you get outside uh, of the media and the adventitia, uh, you perforate the pulmonary artery. Uh, usually we uh, think of injuries to the pulmonary artery uh, from trauma or from regular pulmonary surgery as not being that big of a deal because of the uh, low pressures in the pulmonary artery system. They'll oftentimes not bleed too much. In these patients, it will bleed a lot, and it is very difficult to surgically control these bleeding uh, patients. So uh, the methods to manage that um, uh, include, depending upon, uh, uh, not only is it the, the risk of their uh, bleeding into and out of the lung, but bleeding uh, into the bronchus and causing problems with gas exchange in the other lung. 
So this is a, a picture of a bronchial blocker placed into the right main bronchus to exclude uh, uh, the blood from coming up uh, and uh, causing asphyxiation uh, of the other lung. Uh, this is a chest x-ray of the bronchial blocker and the right uh, main bronchus. And this patient uh, was put on uh, vino vino ECMO. Uh, this is a, with an Ivalon catheter. There's other ways to manage that. Uh, uh, and uh, even still, in some patients, that's not enough to control the bleeding. Um, and that uh, there are techniques where you can go on uh, 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 conventional uh, veno uh, VA ECMO, veno arterial ECMO, uh, cannulate uh, the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava, and place a third cannula into the pulmonary artery to drain the blood from the pulmonary artery uh, until it... Uh, until it uh, uh, clots uh, and stops bleeding. Uh, how about the impact of uh, pulmonary hypertension? So it's, it's, it's uh, well known that the higher the uh, PA pressure, the higher the pulmonary vascular resistance, the higher the risk is of the surgery. Those are the patients, uh, or those are among the patients who have the highest risk for, uh, for surgery uh, with uh, regard to uh, 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 right ventricular dysfunction afterwards. Uh, and uh, I guess I should say that uh, early on they learned if you have bad right ventricular function to start with, that there really is no degree of right ventricular function, uh, no degree of, of uh, bad right ventricles that should exclude the patient from having this operation. That if you decrease the pulmonary vascular resistance, the right ventricular function will significantly improve over time, but, uh, but those patients are at a little bit higher risk for the uh, surgery, and those patients uh, sometimes need to be supported. Their right ventricle needs to be supported uh, with uh, VA ECMO. But in those patients who have uh, residual pulmonary hypertension, ironically, uh, if, they, if they do uh, survive the operation, that over time, this is a report from uh, Freed, uh, that shows that persistent pulmonary hypertension doesn't seem to impact their long-term survival. Why that is, I don't completely understand, but, uh, but even with persistent pulmonary hypertension, uh, defined uh, for this disease as a mean pressure greater than 30, uh, the survival is not statistically significant uh, over time. So we talked a little bit about uh, using circuitry rest, and we always worry about the impact of heart surgery and uh, uh, certainly circuitry arrest on uh, cognitive function. The incidence of stroke, of a fixed stroke in these patients is actually quite low uh, compared to conventional surgery. Uh, and that uh, so these patients uh, can develop some transient neurologic dysfunction or some encephalopathy. Uh, we have methods certainly when we're doing aortic surgery to preserve blood flow to the brain by doing anti-grade cerebral perfusion. And this is a report uh, from a study in Europe where they actually uh, compared uh, circuitry arrest with selective anti-grade cerebral perfusion uh, for this operation, and in fact found no difference that uh, maintaining blood flow to the brain as opposed to circuitry arrest made no difference. And uh, the remarkable finding of this study as well was that if you did neurocognitive function on these patients, it was actually improved long-term compared to their baseline. I'll say that again. So I used to have a cardiology friend that would tell a patient, nobody ever got smarter having heart surgery. Well, for this disease, <laughs> patients do get smarter after heart surgery, that their baseline neurological function, which is uh, uh, presumably impaired because of this problem uh, does get better uh, with surgery. So uh, with that, uh, I like that term closing reflection. So I'm going to give you my closing reflections. So uh, CTEP is a, a severely underdiagnosed, sometimes misdiagnosed, and certainly undertreated uh, disease. And at least to date, surgically, uh, surgery appears to be the best treatment for this disease and for the patients with this disease and should be considered 
in the appropriately diagnosed patient the first line of, uh, of treatment. Um, uh, it sh these patients should be referred to centers of uh, excellence. Uh, and as I said earlier, I think it is important for all of us to help develop more centers of excellence to take care of this growing uh, wave of patients. And if uh, these patients are thought not to be good candidates at your center, they should be referred for a second opinion. Uh, and I think that much of this, uh, our understanding of this disease and the diagnosis of the disease is due to the advancements in uh, imaging, uh, some of the instrumentations and surgical techniques that allow us to do these complicated operations on these complicated patients. So with that, thank you very much.